May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Does it surprise you that Jesus was tempted? This gospel story, in one version or another, depending on what year we're in, comes up every, uh, every year on the first Sunday of Lent. And every year, I am surprised. I'm not sure why. Maybe it's because I think Jesus should have it all together and be beyond the everyday business that we deal with. The thing about Jesus that is so powerful and beautiful is that he was human in every way. He was just like us. He knew what it was like to grow up, to become an adult, to learn a trade and make a living, to live with a family and in a community. He knew the struggles that we all face, those explicit temptations that we face, and the implicit ones as well. So let's take a look at the temptations. There are three of them. The first is the devil tempting Jesus to make food for himself out of a stone. Remember, Jesus has been fasting, so no doubt he was pretty hungry. The second is for Jesus to be given all the power and all the wealth in the world. And the third one is an interesting one. It's as if the devil was getting tired of Jesus quoting scripture to him, so he turns around and quotes it back to Jesus and uses the scripture to tempt Jesus into proving he's the Son of God by jumping off the, the pinnacle of the temple and commanding the angels to save him. All of these temptations have at their heart a challenge to Jesus' identity. If you are the Son of God, the devil says, or deny your identity as the Son of God and worship me, and finally, the devil tells Jesus to prove it, prove that you are the Son of God. Now this is an identity that's just been named by God at Jesus' baptism, immediately before Jesus went into the wilderness for these 40 days. It was his baptism that compelled him there. This gospel is telling us something about the nature of temptation and the nature of sin. Perhaps sin is anything we do that denies our identity as God's beloved. We tend to think of sin as immoral acts, things like lying, cheating, and stealing. And we just read the Ten Commandments at the beginning of the service. And those certainly count as sins. But rather than focusing on our behavior, taking a look at the motivation inside of us might be more productive. Now, unlike Jesus, we don't have a devil outside of us to tempt us away from our identity. We just have the devil of our own ego. The devil of our fears and anxieties and insecurities. When we are motivated by these fears and anxieties and insecurities, whatever that may mean for each of us, it is likely two things are going on. First, whatever those fears and anxieties are that motivate us, they will likely be hidden from us. Human beings are masters of self-deception, and we can turn any fear into a need, and any insecurity into a self-righteous cause. Meanwhile, the real stuff going on inside of us remains lurking in the shadows, unknown and unnamed. The second thing that goes on when our fears and anxieties are motivating us is this loss of connection with our identity as God's beloved. Imagine if Jesus would have said to the devil, okay, sure, let's do it. Would Jesus have been related to his own identity as God's beloved? Or would Jesus be acting out of his own desire for security and for power? Clearly, that was a desire he had. Otherwise, the devil's invitations would just be that, an invitation, and not a temptation. But Jesus stayed related to his identity, and when he does that, all that is lurking in the shadows is brought to light and seen for what it is. Now here's the thing that is purely miraculous. It is so much harder and 
takes so much more effort to hold on to those fears and anxieties as what motivates us. It is exhausting work. Because fear and anxiety is a bottomless pit of need. The more it is fed, the hungrier it gets. However, when we shift away from fear, when we remain centered in our identity as God's beloved, the fear and anxiety tend to fall away. This is the power of the season of Lent. This time the church devotes to self-examination and penitence, fasting and self-denial. We don't do this as punishment. Many people think of this as punishment, but that's not why we do it. We do this to quiet the devil that is inside of us, the devil of our anxiety and our fear. The devil that leaves us feeling not quite good enough, not quite worthy of God's love. And we do it to raise the volume on the voice of God inside of us that says, You are my child. I love you. That's it. That's all we need. And love, God's love, is way more powerful than any of our fears. How many of you have given up something for Lent? I too have given up something for Lent, and this is the first time in many years. Uh, for a long time, I took, uh, I, I took on a practice, a spiritual practice during Lent, instead of giving something up. Uh, but perhaps it's the time in my life or the circumstances of my life, but this year I decided to give something up. And it's been a fascinating experience. Each time I deny myself, and for me what I'm giving up is intentional sugar, and I can tell you what that means after uh, the service if you're interested. Um, so each time I deny myself this intentional sugar, and there are plenty of opportunities to indulge in intentional sugar, starting with the donuts here on Sunday mornings, <laughs> delivered at about 7.30. Uh, each time I deny myself, I have an evolving insight into my own fears and insecurities. I am learning a lot about myself. All those devilish things inside of me are being brought to the light. And it's not comfortable. But I am becoming more and more aware, day by day, and it's only been five days, of how much I have overshadowed my identity as God's beloved, with this devilish self-deception. The grace in it for all of us is when we can see these devilish fears, anxieties, and insecurities for exactly what they are. They lose their power, and the power of God in us is made stronger. The power of God in us is at its strongest when we are face-to-face -face with those things that want us to deny. So I wish you all a happy, grace-filled Lent. Remember, this is not a season of punishment. It is, it is a season of growing in God's gracious love and in our identity as God's beloved children. God's love is way more powerful than any fear we have. Thanks be to God.